What about then as a, 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 let's talk about T1 as a team mm. in that sense. So obviously at the moment they're on this like near unprecedented run. They haven't lost a game. They've even beaten obviously the main rivals in Gen G in the first round robin. We're in the second round robin now if people don't know. These are all best of three series it goes out saying. So this is the other thing as well. I think that's the most underplayed part of this run so far is even when people hear now like 21 and 0, they go like, well, for now, when it zero. Yeah, best of ones oh, in the man. LEC, you fuck. What are you talking about? Like, there's like two yeah, teams could even well. maybe beat them back. Yeah, exactly. These are best of threes, guys. So, on the one hand, look, if you actually are the best team, in theory, best of three also means you can lose a game and win the series. But winning three, all those best of three series, that's fucking really hard to do. If people don't watch the LPL, in the LPL, sometimes even the best teams just trip over and lose well, to like the third to didn't, last didn't team. LNG randomly. just go like undefeated and then lose three series off back. Oh, happens pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, to me, this, this is some epic shit. So, let's get into it then what have you thought of this t1 team because obviously people don't know it effectively is the t1 team you saw last year it's just they actually removed the other parts of the roster and they've just committed to this team now oh gosh there so, are so to be to off. be fair i i think that winning all those best of threes is actually less impressive than winning all those best of ones because there's the opportunity to correct for mistakes yep. and it's not like team one hasn't dropped a bunch of games so i i just because I don't know. It's it's how you take it. Like certainly be a ones are more coin flippy. So you have to like get lucky a couple of times. Whereas like, I think in most best of threes, the better team is going to come out on top uh, overall. Right. It's a, it's more likely that that happens. So what, so, what you consider more difficult, right. Um, is I would say up is, for grab. The caveat is that if you've got two teams you're facing in a week and you have to prep for both of them, one of them is a stronger team, one of them is a weaker team. In the LCK, the level of teams is going to be that even the weaker teams, if you're not prepping for them, can really trip you up. And you don't have back to back days of games, though. That's the thing. Okay, not back to back, but yeah. I mean, in in terms of like just in terms of prepping for different teams and, and best of best of threes, I, I think that there are the level of teams in the LCK. Typically, you're like you're more likely to get tipped um, like tripped up by a lower tier team that has really hard prep for you um than in say like i don't know 2015 lec or um, eu lcs or whatever that that was it was a very different landscape back then i mean the the average level of the lck um mechanically is very high comparative to back then so yeah i, I definitely agree with the best one point in terms i mean look at the upsets in in worlds and stuff like that right one of the big um one of the big arguments against best of one double round robin group stage in worlds is actually you're not actually getting the correct results because the better teams are losing to random games now that can happen in best of one formats too, but uh, in regular seasons. But in terms of the best of three side of things, I still think it is very impressive that SKT, sorry, T1 have um, managed to keep up this streak. Even although there is the caveat of the COVID stuff. Yeah, the, the, the Gen G match it, wasn't it, really mm. what we wanted to see, right? Yeah. Because there were players out in that match, so there are. It's kind of like a fraudulent perfect run, but also T1 are super good, so. There's an asterisk, sadly. As much as this is a great run, can it be like greatest of all time run? There's always going to be an asterisk next to that, which is really sad because I feel like this is a team which could have done that even even with um, all of those things kind of. There's in, still but... a chance if you go undefeated on the whole season. Maybe that makes up for it. Oh, that'd be crazy. Yeah, maybe go undefeated. Also, on this guess what? It's a perfect time to talk about this because on Thursday we get the T T1 Gen G rematch. So it's it's a great time to have this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think of them as a team, anyway, in general? As a team, um, I think they are so much more uh, stable as a team. I mean, we particularly going through their Worlds run with Kana. Kana was... I think we saw, like, the, the, the upper ceiling of his play when he was playing with a lead, and sometimes... I mean, I'm thinking of... I think there was a Cannon game versus Down 1 where he was super far ahead, and he just, just couldn't do anything with it. He just struggled to find the angles. I think that um, Zeus has been really solid. He's plays everything that the team needs him to do. Um, he's very responsible with his leads. Um, and then obviously the meta for bot lane has been so incredible for this team because Gimme You See on the Jinx and the Fellows is just absurdly good. Yep. And the fact that there's actually quite a lot of open support picks too between Enchanters and Engage, I can't think of a better player to give support random options to than Carrier. Um, so there's a lot of things working out for this team. I'd be interested to see what happens to them when Jinx of Felios inevitably falls out of meta, because that's, there's, I don't see a way that that meta lasts the whole season. That It's going to get nuked at some point. But um, as the meta stands right now, they are very on the same page. They understand uh, like the, the fights that they want to take, and that's something which a lot of teams have struggled with worldwide in terms of, we should just fight now without really understanding why. I think T1 typically have done a bit better on that, and they've shown that clutch factor through that understanding, which is really separate them from being like a good team to like a really, really great team. 
Do you yeah. think, uh, I want to get you the thoughts of both of you, so maybe Monty, you can deal with this first. What do you think about the fact that, like, one of the first things I actually thought when they announced those teleport changes is, like, this is an example of a team where it's, like, the bot lane of fucking T1 on paper is primed to take advantage of that, that you can't mm. just teleport early on with all these fucking god tier mid laners with a million dashes. You can't just go with the bot lane and gang bang the guy anymore. Now you actually have to have some real 2v2 lanes. Like, <laughs> obviously, they on paper have arguably one of the best bot lanes in the whole world. Yeah, and they're playing through it. I think if you, if the way, T1 has a very specific way of playing right now, which is extremely effective in this meta. If you, so let's contrast this. If you guys haven't been watching T1 compared to what we saw T1 doing at Worlds, um, so what was happening at Worlds, and I think there are several reasons probably why they're doing this. The meta of is one of those reasons. But they also had a bunch of rookie players last year, right? Like they were yeah. dealing with a bunch of new players. Um, they were kind of, acclimating them over time. You have to remember they went through a massive coaching change. They ran for half of last year. They ran that incredibly stupid, like 10 player roster. Uh, they fired the coaches, by the way, Faker is still the coach of this team. In case anybody was curious about that, it's not Pult. I'll tell you that it ain't Pult guys. So what happened was they fired the coaches. Faker basically became a player coach. He is still, as I understand it from talking to people, uh, in Korea, that he is basically still the coach of that team. Um, and so, you know, he has additional responsibilities. Now, how did this manifest? It manifested in him playing like counter matchups, uh, very low economy style that we saw at Worlds. Nice. We had a conversation. Is Faker the worst mid laner on a Korean team? Answer was probably yes, especially when it came to mechanics. But what he was doing was enabling the side lanes, especially the bot lane, super well. He would play Lissandra into LeBlanc, and then he would just walk all over the map and go kill people in the bot lane as LeBlanc, or as uh, Lissandra, rather. And he was playing really well. So it wasn't an issue. It was just he was playing a different kind of style. So let's fast forward to now. Faker looks much more in shape mechanically. His team is playing around him very very well, and he is being left on his own more. So there's a big difference. Um, let's actually pull up the world stats. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously stats in League of Legends are can be questionable. Like, I, I don't want to do topic. this. Yeah, I don't want to do this spiel every time, but they also can be very useful for certain things. But if we look, and especially with uh, regions that have higher sample sizes, uh, like LCK and LPL, one of the things that's going on right now with T1 overall is that Faker actually does not have a very high kill participation, which is different than what was happening at Worlds, right? Uh, as far as kill participation goes, he's actually, what, second, uh, second lowest uh, compared to BDD, actually, within the league, at only 61% of KP currently within LCK this split. Um, now, who has a much higher kill participation, interestingly, is Gumayushi. And so if you it's watch... It's fights around Gumayushi. Yeah. It, and also, they rotate around him. They'll get him out of the bot lane early. They'll move him up to Herald. We talked about this trend in Korea before Worlds with an emphasis on first Herald in these rotations. Um, they've been playing more with their jungler owner around the bottom lane. And they've been basically, you know, force-feeding Gumayushi a ton of resources. Um, and Faker has been playing much more solo in the side lanes, especially split pushing into the mid and late game. Um, and this is just the way that they want to do things. Like they will put a lot of pressure on the top lane by rotating Karia and Gumiyushi up top early to get Herald charges in. And Faker's just kind of doing his own thing on the map. Now, the thing where I think T1 is really succeeding is that they are they're they're not actually great at playing the lane. Sometimes they make really kind of shitty mistakes in the laning phase. But the thing is, is that when they make a mistake, they will cross map very effectively in order to pick up. They they will they will force a mistake on the other side of the map from their team. And the other thing they do very well is they set up on objectives early and they set up well and they know their win conditions with their comp around the objective. Now, part of this is, I think, as Naimir alluded to, they do not have a wide variety of compositions that they use. And that Gumiyushi has been playing, you know, a lot of Aphilios, a lot of like, Jinx, a lot see, of... Like, we're not going to see, like, the Jin, Jin Ziggs, Leona stuff out of them. Not, not no. right now. <laughs> not right now. And it's good because they, they want to create pressure bot lane. They want to push the wave. They want to rotate for objectives early. This is what they do. This is how they play the game. It's probably the best way to play the game right now. Um, yeah. Uh, overall. And so they're using the, the champs that are strong. But if you look at what Gumiyushi has played this season, 22 out of his 29 games have been on Aphilios, Jinx, or Caitlyn. Uh, and in his career, uh, encompassing last year as well, Aphilios and Jinx 
are Aphelios, he's played 29 professional games. The next one is Jinx with 12. So, I mean, this is, this is an enormous percentage of his... I will say, area. if people don't know, because this might be confusing if you didn't follow any of the Asian regions, last year, they still actually would sometimes in the LPL, etc., force Jinx, for example, and they would play it, mm. even though in the West, you know, it was largely, like, just ignored completely by almost everyone. It was, it, was well, still, it was still a big pick, though, in the Asian regions. So, essentially, yeah. the Met is hitting this guy right in his face right now. <laughs> Yeah, and he was and, really good anyway. <laughs> yeah, and, now now we know that he is good at certain champs that are not meta. Like he's a great Samira player, like really sure. fucking good. Yeah. Um, so and we've seen like glimpses of this in professional play, but for the most part, you know, he's been kind of riding this meta, and well, and he's also had an enormous amount of support from his team in order to ride this meta, which is that. You know, in international competitions, Faker was babysitting him, basically, and sacrificing a huge amount of his own resources in order to do that. And they've now dropped themselves into a meta, whereas Thorin says the TP changes have made it so he can play a lot of these, like, hyper-carry bots or very aggressive lane-pushing bots. Um, and the, then he can just free himself up on the map, and as opposed to Faker coming to him, he just goes, walks around the map and takes objectives, sets up on the objectives early, and T1 is real good at playing these objective fights. So I think like T1 is a great team right now. I don't think they're without their flaws. And no. I do question how meta independent they are going to be because of how I, it's not necessarily one dimensional because they understand how the pieces of their composition work in each like unique compositional case versus their opponents. So you can tell that, they're not just like robotically, you know, running the same kind of team fights because the way they team fight with similar champions changes depending on their synergies and, and their opponents, uh, champions, which is great to see. But at the same time, you're looking at Faker, who's been playing like very meta, like Victor, Corky, LeBlanc, uh, you know, it's it's not terribly exciting. Is what but, I will but, say. What they're, do, what they're doing really well for Faker, because it, if you think about kind of the evolution of Faker as a player, we had him like popping off in season three, trying to be the mechanical hyper carry still in season four, like making all the, all the crazy assassin plays, but then obviously the team falling apart around him. Then you hit season five through eight, where it's just all teleport, all like into big team fights with the, the rise of stuff like your Ariana and your Syndra, Zir kind of stuff coming back for so many seasons. This feels to me like the first time where. One, he has like a really competent shot caller on his team that's doing their job really well in Carrier. Yep. Um, and also with the TP changes, he can play something which has a bit more room to kind of do its own stunts rather than just kind of be the, the, the cheerleader for the rest of the team. Talking about the obje objective setup, I think one of the really important things which T1 do is give like a good 20 to 30 second window or more to just allow Faker to do something. Just, just hands off, Faker, do something with LeBlanc or Ari. And he's been doing really well with, the, with that window of time to find the necessary pick to then start trying to initiate the fight on their terms. And that's that's one of the big pickups I've had about this team. And clearly, I totally agree with you, Nightmare. And one of the things that's been so interesting to me to watch about this team is that they will blow major cooldowns to chunk people, like you're saying, mm. 20 or 30 seconds. Like, Korea will do it as well on Lux. Like, he will just go ahead and use Lux Laser to, to send somebody to half HP um, if he can land the bind first and then proc the passive. Because he knows that then they're going to get priority on the objective and that they're going to, you know, force people into a very uncomfortable situation. And Faker does the exact same thing. So they're really good at getting these incremental advantages that then snowball into major objectives. And the other thing that they're really honestly amazing at doing is their communication must be so fucking good because I watch some of Why these fights. Priori. <laughs> I watch some of these fights around objectives and it's like, the way that they're communicating their positions and like NAR rage bar fucking perfectly where they don't start the objective until like right before the NAR rage bar starts. NAR is perfectly in position to zone them out with the threat of the NAR ultimate. And then the objective is just done by the time that the mega NAR ends. It's like, it's flawless. Like it's actually really beautiful to watch if, you, if you're looking for these placements and their communication is so fucking good right now um, around who has their abilities up, how they can zone effectively given the tools that they have, who's getting the poke damage down, who can even die and it doesn't matter uh, as long as they kind of just like strategically int. Um, so, you know, it's really, it's really impressive to watch. By the way, one, as a quick aside, did his name have to be Carrier? 
because it's so close to Korea that you're going to have that problem. I'll tell you a quick aside. I once did an interview like that back at you when I worked. I think it was on a Zeske Gaming. I once did an interview with this Korean StarCraft player, and it was through a translator. And I only realized 10 minutes into the interview, oh, this fucking translator guy kept thinking I'm saying the, the name of the country, Korea, and I've been saying Korea, like as in your Korea. And I kept wondering, why am I getting these answers back? Like I was asking him stuff like, so what do you actually think about where you're at in your career right now? And he was just answering stuff like, that's where I'm so, from, you know, where else would I want to be? And I was thinking, these are fucking really weird <laughs> philosophical answers. And obviously it just ruined it. So was this, any, uh, was this the, the world's first version of like geo, like GeoGuessr or something like that? Like, <laughs> it wasn't great, was it? So all I'm going to say is we're going to run into that problem with the career, career one, I can already fucking see. And then the other angle is this though. I also think the fact that I'm actually very impressed, especially if, as Monty says, essentially they just let Faker coach the team now. Well, this is a type of SKT we've never seen before. Like, like, even when they essentially did play through Piglet when they had him, it was a, obviously was an AD carry, they still were never like a bot-centric team. Like, that team, he just happened to be one of the people who got carried champions. Like, if you remember, that was a team, if anything, they were fucking kings of the pick comp, weren't they? Like, the idea that they would essentially play, like, Uzi Eye style around an ADC in T1 is such a culture clash to the history of the Org. And how is that... Remember, this was a team that played through mid and top the entire history of the Org, pretty much. So, I think it's really interesting. And also, I think it's really cool personally because there's never been a Korean ADC who was like this every other Korean ADC their dream is to be deft ruler and it's like in theory you're typically trying to be the team fight ADC that's all you try you're not trying to be like an Uzi I forgiven and smash the lane every time what's cool to me is they've got a player who it's, it's totally appropriate to play that way around him like he actually has that sort of mindset for the game so I'm just so fascinated by the fact they've had to sort of like completely pivot what they're doing as an org but it's working like this is what you should do when you have this personnel I, I think there's still a level of danger to it. Like, I think Gumayushi still positions too aggressively at times. Like, he... We're talking at a very high level of play, but, like, you know, this last week he was getting, like, flash, rise rooted, and, like, you, you just can't have that happen if you're Jinx. Like, that's... You know, you have to know that the rise... The, the rise has flash and, like, not walk there. Um, and at, at a very high level of League of Legends play, those mistakes will cost T1. And I think, you know, people will look at T1 right now and they'll say, wow, you know, this team is is on a historic win streak, despite caveats that we've brought up and asterisks regarding, uh, you know, some of their most powerful opponents not being able to run their full rosters yet. Uh, but also, the way that they play sometimes they they make mistakes in the laning phase which cause them to have to do other things on the map or sometimes they make positional mistakes in team fights um sometimes they can get away with it because one thing that they are good at is knowing like somebody will play aggressively if they see the jungler like Zayas will will all in but the thing about that is you have to be able to sometimes mechanically outplay people and like are you going to do that against top chinese teams i'm not sure that that you know trying to make up for mistakes that you've made via mechanical outplay is necessarily it's a great like they've plan. had to clutch things a lot um yeah. and it's it, it's kind of part of that magic of say like summer 2015 skt when they they started pulling that off and that was that was a great part of their roster where actually no matter how far they get behind they've always got the ability to play themselves out of a pit um some of the teams they're doing it against locally probably don't want to be falling behind against uh some of the teams which they have done but the fact that they have that clutch factor is still it's still good to see that they don't fall apart when they do have deficits against them and Admittedly, there are a lot of mechanics in the game to allow you to come back from big deficits right now. I mean, just have to look at like the, the G2 Misfits game where you give no. every shutdown over to a we'll to Akali and <laughs> everything with that. And you're just like, oh, well, okay, game's over then. You've given everything to a champion that can't die at this point because they've got a Yumi on them. But uh, it, it's good to know that even with all the mechanics into it, T1 do have like this extra gear to shift into because inevitably at international competitions, there are going to be teams that smash you early at some point. There's really sucker punch you and you have to play from that kind of deficit. Yeah, so and this, you don't hear any slander like that. Like, if, if you actually essentially mis, misposition but use mechanics to get out of trouble, you could win eight LCS titles, go to an MSI final, probably wouldn't do great at Worlds. Spoiler, that was double his whole career. So, just double his whole career. <laughs> and guess what? Yes, when he had to face the Asian AD carries every year, he was like, this is actually a lot harder. I wish I'd sort of been yeah. more important <laughs> before now. Probably not the time to learn how to, you know, position yeah, These guys now. got hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, it, I just think it's interesting too because. It shows a shift in the Korean mentality, at the very least, that 
if something happens somewhere and somebody realizes that they can play aggressive, they will skill check. That is new, frankly, to oh, Korea for sure. over the last few years. Yeah. Like, and it's a good sign that that is that that is happening, and it's a good sign that players like Zayas are willing to just be like, "Well, I see everybody bot lane. Time to all in this motherfucker up here in top." Um, my question is like, should that be necessary? Because it is predicated. People will focus on the cool 1v1 that just happened in top and ignore the fact that that 1v1 yeah. didn't really have to happen if bot didn't randomly die. Uh, so this is not a team without its flaws. Uh, I will say that. Now, if they can get through the laning phase, it, they become extremely difficult to beat because their macro is so fucking good. Um, so the lane allocation has been like really immaculate. Lane like, assignments are great. Out. Early rotations are great. Look at the way they snuck that, that Baron uh against uh hanwha life uh by popping in there popping in from the back of the pit on red side with the jin Zhao and the jinx in the late game where they just knew where all of the vision was and just completely took it away like these are kind of calls that you can only do with very specific compositions that are capable of of making these kind of plays and they're making them so their creativity in their macro is also very good so you know you you head into a mid-game state even or behind on t1 you're probably not going to win that game but I just am concerned about, you know, God Chinese laners like rocking up and, and putting them in a scenario where they can't do well. And also it has to be said in this meta, uh, a lot of T1's compositions are based off of poke or based off of being able to deal damage on Range like a... Range advantage is a huge thing in the meta exactly. anyway. It's, it's just true. what side of it you're playing from, because typically Korean teams, if they have a range advantage, and this was talking to... I think it was around MSI when a lot of the players were obviously like all the Korean players were like over here scrimming, and a lot of the European teams were saying, you just can't give a range advantage to the Korean teams, they're too good at playing it out. Now, yep. I don't think that was true uh, with all of the teams, but, um, you know, you look at even coming through the Worlds and the say the semi-final between um Dan one skt and uh you had like the Jin maokai Jin zillion stuff cropping up and just like teams know how to play around the Jin at this point like if you give them it they know how to rotate to impact mid they know how to get a lead and then suddenly you don't have the ability to snap all in them and stop them using that range advantage now when you come into this one where it's not Jin on the other side it's a jinx or a fellas which is gonna you know crap on your team fight even harder at that point things get very difficult to problem solve. Now, when you have a player like Gumi Yusi, who is very good at Aphelios, you don't have to worry about the range discrepancy between something like a Jinx and Aphelios, which tends to be the trade-off. He's like, oh, okay, in mid-game, we're going to have better team fights with Aphelios when he's got Gale Force and the ability to really just pump out damage uh, before Jinx kind of comes online, at the, even more so at three, four items. But even with that, I do worry what happens, as you were saying, though, in terms of what happens when T1 have to shift away from that. Maybe it comes back to, I don't know, more Silas games coming into, into mid lane and less Victor, less Corky, uh, and the ability to kind of like, do you have to brawl it out and not play the more, the patient fights and uh, look for that big play with the range? Well, it's also that T1 as a whole has not been playing engage heavy compositions. What they've been doing is they've been playing compositions that do well once they have priority over an objective where if you try and play into them you get destroyed like you you don't want to be playing into like a fucking nar jace affilios you know corky like here are the here are the top three most played champs for every member of t1 zayas jace nar gragas okay you can say gragas is more of an engage heavy champion that's fine the other ones mostly rely on already having control over an objective and people playing into you owner Jin Zhao, Lee Sin, Viego, Faker, Victor, Corky, LeBlanc, Gumayushi, Aphelios, Jinx, Caitlyn, and Korea is playing Thresh, Karma, and Tom Kench. These are, for the most part, the, if you were to take the top three most played champions of all of these players and craft compositions out of them, almost all of them yeah. are <laughs> oak compositions uh, that kite and peel effectively. And that if you can get, if you can muscle your way in front of a dragon or a baron and you force the other team to play into you, they're great. If you have to try and get in onto an objective, it becomes much more challenging. What's um, really interesting about that, though, is like there are other teams worldwide which are trying that and they're not doing nearly as well with it. Uh, say, I mean, the big one for me is someone like Mad Lions in Europe who have tried to play zero engage. Viego compositions were like, sweet, we're going to get soul point and you're going to have to contest us at some point. But they just make like one or two mistakes. 
And that's all it takes with these kind of comms to let go of the lead. And then suddenly you don't actually have the map position or the just the raw fighting potential to muscle your way into a certain area of the map and force the enemy to come into you. So I think it does say something about how T1 are playing to get those leads and playing to set up at objectives like you called out before. But the question is, you know, at a certain point, is, it, is there going to be some flaws in their style which are exposed and where they make one or two mistakes and they can't play out these compositions? Yeah, that's my question. So I, I, I think that obviously it's really exciting to run. They're, on, they're extremely good at playing these compositions. So I'm not saying like it's going to be easy to stop them from doing this, especially because these compositions, when played well, are the apex of the meta right now. Like it's hard to see a team that is using these tools in a better macro sense than T1 is. And it's not, again, it's not flawless in the laning phase, but they are still doing it super, super well. And they, they're creative, they're tricky. Um, yeah, they're, just a, they're a really good team, but I, I don't see it Pretty as good. totally without flaw. That's, that's my point. Want to see more cool, funny, interesting clips based on topics from my content? Well, subscribe to this channel then, or, you know, be a pleb and don't.